for finances and our uh, the next gen classes that is happening downstairs. So, uh, let's all bow down our heads. Heavenly Father, we worship you. Truly, you are great, O Lord, and mighty. And everything is from you, O Lord. And everything that we have comes from you, Lord. We pray for Pastor Ryan as he speaks to us. I pray that you touch his lips, O God. I pray that you anoint his lips, O God. And uh, override all his preparations, O Lord. I pray that he will speak only what you want him to speak. Nothing more, nothing less. And I pray that you touch our hearts. The Holy Spirit will touch our hearts, convict our heart, and open our hearts and our minds during the message. I pray also, O Lord, for all the tithes and offerings that uh, has been given, O Lord. I pray for all the hands that has give, uh, gave them, O Lord. I pray that you would give us wisdom, give the leaders wisdom on how to spend this for your glory alone, O Lord. And I pray for all the uh, next-gen classes happening downstairs, O Lord. I pray for all the kids, even though they are young, O Lord, we know that you, that you can communicate even to young um, and in age, O Lord. I pray that you give wisdom te to the teachers, O Lord, uh, during, the, during their classes, O Lord. We pray all these things through your Son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So let's welcome our pastor, Pastor Ryan. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Philip. So it's uh, good to see many of you, and hopefully after the service, I can get to talk to you as well. Uh, it's been great. Uh, been, uh, it's been great to be back. The past two weeks, I've been in uh, my family and I have been with uh, Melbourne in CCF, CCF Melbourne, and in CCF Sydney. So we praise God. God is on the move in Oceania region. God is really working. God is uh, touching lives and doing miracles and transforming people's lives. All right. So next week will be our Christmas service, right? Okay. So we're excited because uh, many people from CCF Wellington will be coming over. So we're going to have like a, a joint celebration, Wellington and, um, and Auckland. All right. So uh, when, you, when you see them next week, um, Make sure that you give your best CCF Auckland welcome. Okay? So, it's good. It's good. All right. So, how's everyone? Are you feeling hot? Okay. You can go home. So, no, I'm just kidding. No, it's, it's fine. It's fine. So, uh, are you legit hot? Okay. What are, what's their series? Okay. Legit, right? So, um, we will continue that series today and we'll have a special uh, message next Sunday all about Christmas. So we encourage you, invite your friends because this is especially the time wherein people are most willing to listen to the gospel, to the Christmas message. Um, so it will be great for them to hear the gospel and let's leave the results to the Lord. <coughs> okay, so growing up, I like watching uh, Disney cartoons. Do you remember? Do you watch Disney cartoons? Okay, so what is your favorite Disney cartoon? Can you, can you tell your seatmate who is your favorite Disney cartoon character? Huh? Growing up. So growing up, maybe for me growing up, um, it's Elsa and... Uh, <laughs> growing up. Okay. Well, you know what? Growing up, I watched this uh, Disney cartoon, not really my favorite. I really didn't like it, but uh, it was a unique cartoon character. Okay? Do you know the name of this cartoon character? If you can uh, show, the, show the slide, do you know? No, that's Jiminy Cricket. I'm just joking. Yes, that is Pinocchio. Yeah? And uh, what's unique about Pinocchio is that he is a wooden puppet uh, made by someone who did not have a child but wanted to have a child, so he decided to come up with a wooden puppet, and that wooden puppet suddenly came to life. And what is unique with Pinocchio? What is unique? First, he's a wooden puppet, right? And what's the second? Okay. Every time he tells lies, what happens? His nose grows every time. And it seems like this has crept up into our modern culture, wherein... Um, if someone lies, we kind of tease them, hey, don't lie or else your nose will grow long. I wonder how many of us will have longer noses if this applies to us, right? 
Now, I, I heard of a story uh, shared by Pastor Peter that there was a lady who wanted to uh, have a bi- biography written. So he, she hired a biographer to do research about her ancestry so that she can come up with a book about um, her ancestry. During the research of the biographer, the biographer found out that there was one great-grandfather of theirs in their lineage that was a criminal. And because he was a criminal, he was caught and had to, be, um, had to experience the death penalty. Of course, when the biographer shared that to the lady, the lady said, can you remove that from, you, from the biography, from the book? And of course, what will the biographer say? No, right? Because that's part of the biography. So she said, okay, can you put it in, but can you reword it in a creative way? All right? So this is how it was written by the biographer. One of her, one of her great-grandfathers occupied the chair of applied electricity in one of America's best-known institutions. He was very much attached to his position and literally died in the harness. In other words, executed by electric chair. All right? So, isn't it interesting that you want to tell the truth, but there are ways that you can twist the truth so that the truth is covered up? Now, during the past few weeks, we continue the series on the legit series, and we talk about the Sermon on the Mount. And if I can just show you a chart, just a little review. Okay, we talked about you shall not murder, but Jesus was talking about not just external murder, but what is the heart of that topic or what is the heart behind that rule or that command. It says it, it's more about everyone who is angry with his brother is guilty. Not only is it external when you talk about you shall not commit adultery, but the but Jesus said, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her. So it, was, it is not just about the external uh, obedience, but it's the obedience of the heart. Another is, whoever sends his wife away, give her a marriage, a certificate of divorce, right? But internally, whoever divorces his wife makes her commit adultery as well. So that was the topic last, uh, that's week, right? About divorce. So, it's more about not just what is external, but what's in our heart. You will see in all these, God wants you to be truthful. God wants us to be truthful. Now, as we talk about the last one is, um, you shall not make false vows. Matthew 5 verse 33, right? But it says there, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. No need to make vows. Whatever you say, that is what you mean. Okay? So, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, it says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. So, it's making a vow to the Lord, yet you don't fulfill it. Now, why is that inserted in the Sermon on the Mount, the most important sermon ever given? I realized that many people compromise with their tongue. Many people do not keep their word. Again, from these verses, God wants you to be truthful. God wants you to keep your word. So, if we can come up with a definition or a working definition of lying, let's try this. It is making a statement that a person knows is untrue with the intent to deceive. Right? So, if I ask you, how many of you, you have lied at least once in your life? Raise your hand. You have lied at least once in your life. If you do not raise your hand, you are? <laughs> okay. Now, it's easy for you to raise your hand at that question. But if I ask you, did you lie the past seven days? How many of you lied the past seven days? That might be a harder question to ask, right? Or to answer, but based on some research, when it, came, with, when it comes to the number of lies that people say per day, and also in terms of the age gaps, right? Look at this. In this chart, 
per day at age 6 to 8, at least 36% of our children lie at least once a day. Age 9 to 12, more than half. Age 13 to 17, 74%. Three out of four. Who among you are between ages 13 to 17? Okay? Now, when I ask you who's young, no one wants to raise their hand. Before, when I ask who's, who's, who's young, you raise your hand. But that's not the point. You can see in this chart that at least once per day, across all ages, people still lie at least once a day. Even those ages 60 to 77. I wonder what they lie about. They lie about their age. I don't know. Okay? But here's the thing. Not shown in this chart is combining, okay, is a comparison how many people lie per day one to five times. Okay? Versus six or more. You understand? It's not seen here. But how many lie between one to five times per day versus six, to, six or more? Uh, the the mom, number of people who lie one to five times a day is more by only 10% by those who do, with those who lie more than six times. So what is happening here? There was a time wherein you really honor your word. But nowadays, apparently, it is not that way. When we look back at that definition of lying, Okay, we see it is making a statement that the person knows is untrue with the intent to deceive. When, they, when you look at your children, okay, those, who are young, those with young children, do, do they lie? Young children, do they lie? Right? Those uh, below 8 years old, do they lie? Who taught them? Who taught them to lie, right? Well, you know what? It's going to be a hard research or... But you know what? Here's the thing. Maybe it's by nature, but the environment has allowed lying to prosper and propagate. Why is it? Is it, seem, it seems like people might think that lying is an acceptable sin. Especially people might think that lying can be, number one, harmless. It's harmless. But you know what? Integrity is at stake here. And lying will propagate. It is very hard to say only one lie because it will add up. You will have to say another lie to cover up your first lie. Some people think it's alright to lie because there are moments and situations wherein it is justifiable. It is fine to lie because maybe it does, since it doesn't hurt anyone anyway. Right? Sometimes also, we think it's alright to lie because it might even be helpful to lie. Okay? So, have you been lying? Okay? Now, sometimes, you know, there's even lying between husband and wife from the heavy kind of lying like, where have you been? Okay? And then the husband will say, over time, over time. That's heavy. That could be lying, right? Or it can be uh, the, the shallow kind of lie. The wife asks you, asks the husband, Honey, do I look good today? Oh, what will the husband say? Of course! Alright? But it's not lying. Alright? So that's the thing. We have to be careful. It seems like lying has become an acceptable sin not only for Christ followers, but for everyone else. If you will look at the research, so many people lie even today and every day. And it becomes an acceptable sin and we think it can be justified in the eyes of God. What does Proverbs 12 verse 22 say? The Lord detests lying lips, but He delights in people who are trustworthy. The Lord detests he hates it. He does not like it. He hates it. He hates lying lips, but the opposite, he delights for those people who are trustworthy. So you see, the God of truth can never commend lying. Okay? 
How do you feel if you've been tricked or someone lied to you? I ask you, have you has anyone ever lied to you? Okay. Really? Okay. How do you feel when someone lies to you? It pain. There's pain. And sometimes it lingers, right? So we don't want to have lying to be an acceptable sin because it is not. Okay? I still remember when I was young, very young, this was like more than 30 years ago. Okay? Maybe more than 35 years ago. I don't know. Okay? Um, I was talking to a younger kid. Okay? Um, wait. Who has a 9-volt bat- battery? Anyone? 9-volt battery? Does anyone have a 9-volt battery? Oh, wait. By the way, I have. Okay? <laughs> so, I, I remember, I remember, I talked to this kid, and I told the kid who, who was holding a 9-volt battery to lick it with his lips. Okay? Do you understand what I said? Lick it with the lips. And what will happen? Okay, I need a volunteer. Okay? <laughs> J- Gerald, Voltaire, Chilo? Okay, no, 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 no. Okay? What happens when you lick a 9 volt? Okay, you get a little shock. Okay, so the kid licked it and she, he actually jumped. It's like he jumped that way. And I actually was laughing. And then the kid ran to his mom. Okay, and the mom, um, the mom told him off. And then the cousin, the older cousin of that kid came to me and said, Did you... Tell my cousin to, to lick the nine volts. And I said, no. Okay, I said, no. Okay, okay I'm sorry. Okay. This was 30 plus years ago. Okay, I'm 31. Okay. <laughs> I'm lying. Okay, all right? This was a long time ago. But you know what? Think about it. When I was preparing this message, I still remembered something. I did more than 30 years ago, and I'm not proud of it. You know why I, I said that? Because someone also tricked me into doing it. Yeah. So I pass it on to others. And that's the problem with lying. When you are lied at, you start thinking, well, you know what? I got hurt, and maybe it's all right to do it to others. Well, the message today is simple. Okay? But it needs to be discussed. The title is this. Be truthful, keep your word. Can you tell that to your seatmate? Be truthful, keep your word. I pray that by the end of this message, you can overcome all types of lying and start honoring God by being truthful and keeping your word. You see, no society can exist if there is no truth. Because a lot of things are based on trust. And there can be no trust if there is no truth that people will follow. Okay, so are you ready? Okay, are we ready to tackle this quote-unquote acceptable sin? It's my prayer that we're going to break this today. So let's talk about the different kinds of lying. Of course, we talk about the flat-out lies. But what are other kinds of lying that is still lying? Okay, let's... Let's, let's start with this. Number one. Okay? First is half-truth. What is half-truth? It is partially sharing some facts by omitting some important ones that can, mean, that can mislead a person's belief, perception, or decision. For example, when you're selling something to a customer, you share the highlights, but you are concealing major descriptions that must be said to the buyer because that will influence that buyer's decision. And what? We justify it by saying, but you know what? I need the sale. If I don't get the sale, I won't hit my bonus. If I don't hit my bonus, I'm not able to do this. I'm not able to provide for my family. But that means you're saying that the end justifies the means. That is half-truth. Another is exaggeration. What is exaggeration? It is enhancing a truth by adding some lies to it to make the narrative more appealing. Now, I've met people who exaggerate, especially when it comes to accomplishments. Some exaggerate through their CV. But I've heard people exaggerating about their fishing. I caught this big fish, but it got away. 
You heard of that statement? The fish that got away. Alright? You know what? Yeah, okay. I believe you. Okay? But also, also when it comes to sports, someone would exaggerate that, you know what? In basketball, I made the dunk. Right? Okay? So, I've heard of that. But I knew that was exaggerating. Okay? Another is broken promises. It is the failure to keep one's spoken commitment to another person. Okay? So, this is especially damaging when the person who made the promise had no intentions of keeping their word to begin with. Okay? It can be as hard as broken promises between husband and wife. Your promise, the vows that you made during your wedding day, and you broke it. It can be as simple as, as um, what do you call this? You asking someone, will you pray for me? And what will you say? Yes, I'll pray for you. But did you pray for them? Okay, you, break, you broke your promise. Sometimes I ask you, can you pray for me? Oh, no one's answering anymore because you don't want to break your promise. Okay, here's the problem. We make promises because we have a hard time to say no and we just overcommit ourselves sometimes. But still, we break promises because we think it is the easy way out. Another kind of lying is fabrication. It's telling others something you don't know for sure with regards to all the facts, right? So, we've heard of fake news, right? Have you heard of fake news? There are heaps of fake news. Okay, growing up, I have also heard a lot of gossip because in the house, you know, we have some house helpers. They would watch gossip shows. Okay, what are the gossip shows nowadays? Entertainment Tonight. Yeah? Okay? Yeah, growing up, I watched this show. It's called See Through with Indai Badidai. Okay? So, and I hear all this. They're talking and spreading rumors and gossip. And wow, it's, it's, it's crazy. Another is plagiarism. What is plagiarism? It is copying someone else's work and calling it your own. Okay? I have heard, but I've never tried it. I've heard that there is a part of Manila in the Philippines where you can buy your term paper. You can buy a diploma of any school that you want in whatever course that you want to graduate in. Okay? And here's the thing that sometimes really gets us. But it's not even biblical. It's what we call the white lie. Have you heard of the white lie? What is the white lie? They are, that's when you state seemingly harmless false statements claiming to be tactful or polite. In the eyes of God, a lie is a lie. In, in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, and the following verses, we hear of a story between Ananias and Sapphira wherein lying was involved and see how God, how God gave them consequences. So let's read that. In verse 3, Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Now, what's the background here? Ananias and Sapphira, probably very rich, had the land and decided to sell the land to be able to give it to the apostles' feet, to the apostles' work. Was that a good thing? Yes. But what they did was they kept a portion of the amount for themselves and then they offered it to the apostles for their use. Nothing bad with giving the money and donating to the church, right? But you can see that there were other things around it that made it sinful. So, it says here, let's, let's just look at this more, a little bit more. It says here, you have filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? When you lie, it is not just something physical or emotional, but there is a spiritual dimension when you are lying. You are lying to the Holy Spirit. And it says, and have kept money for yourself. What does that mean? Eventually, your lies 
will be found out. Who found out here? Peter. God gave Peter discernment to understand that he, that Ananias and Sapphira was lying. Okay? So God can give discernment to people to also sense that someone is lying or you are lying. In verse 4, it says, Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. It says here, it didn't it belong to you? What were they doing? They were pretending to be generous. The context here is, if you will look at Acts chapter 4, the last verses, Barnabas, the great encourager, also had land and he sold it and he gave the money to the apostles and to the ministry. So perhaps Ananias and Sapphira got the cue from Barnabas and also wanted to receive perhaps some appreciation, right? And copy what Barnabas did. So maybe Ananias was, think, was thinking, oh, I want to be compared by the great encourager Barnabas. You see? It could be that. So it says here, didn't it belong to you? It says here, you know what? You could have been honest anyway, right? You could have, for example, if, if Ananias gave just three-fourths and he kept the one-fourth, he could have been honest and said, you know what, I sold this land and I would like to give three-fourths to the church and keep one-fourth to myself. But he didn't. He lied to the Holy Spirit. It says here, what made you think of doing such a thing? You see, sometimes we think foolishly because one, we think we can get away with lying, we think we can escape lying, and we think we can fool people. When you regularly and constantly lie, trust will be eradicated and people will start being suspicious with anything else that you say. Right? That's why it has to be addressed. And for the Lord, He addressed it in the church. This was not even with the Gentiles. He was addressing lying and deception within the church. In Proverbs 19 verse 5, it says, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who tells lies will not escape. Isn't it the reason why we lie is because we want to escape the consequences? Yes, but here's the verse that God is telling us. He who tells lies will not escape. So your goal for lying will never happen. Maybe you can get away for a little while, temporarily, but later on, it will be found out. Right? So, move, going back. It says, What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to... To whom? To whom? God, right? When we read the verse in verse 3, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Here, you lied to God. This is just another verse equating and saying that there's equality between God and the Holy Spirit. And when you talk about God, there is nothing in this world that can be hidden from the eyes of the Lord. Do you agree with that? He sees your every action. And much more than that, He sees your every motive. Okay? He sees your every motive. So I will share something about that later on. But in verse 5, it says here, when Ananias heard this, what happened? He fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Sometimes, the consequences can be immediate and drastic. I wonder if God was also immediate and drastic today. How many of you will not reach LDC? Because you died along the way. Right? Think about it. It's only by the grace of God that in spite of our deception, we are still alive. And what happened after this? So Ananias died, right? And people got him. And what happened next? The wife. What's the name of the wife? Okay. Sapphira, Sapphira. Okay. Whatever. She's dead. Okay. Verse 9. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord? Listen. 
the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and there they will carry you out also. What does verse 10 say? At that moment, she fell down and he, at his feet and died. Can you imagine? Husband and wife died on the spot. You see, liars and conspirators of lying will experience consequences. We've heard of this line before. You are free to choose, but you are not free to escape the consequences of your actions. Lying will eventually be found out. I wonder if God did the same thing today, how many of us will still be alive or how many of us will still experience a lot of painful consequences. Now I ask you, why do people lie? Why do people lie? Okay? Let me share to you maybe just, just three possible reasons. Why do people lie? Number one, because there's a need for approval and pleasing others. You want to look better than what reality is. That is why you lie. You want the approval that you are lacking. The possible root cause of this is you have a low self-esteem. That is why you need to lie to boost your self-esteem up. Another is, there is fear of consequences if truth is told. You might lose something valuable or you might lose someone valuable if you do not lie. The possible root cause of this is you are lacking trust in the Lord. Right? Because if you trust the Lord, you will trust Him that whatever the consequence is, I will speak the truth. And number three is there is a desire for power and control over people and situations. I still remember we would lie. We were taught to lie in the corporate world because I was in sales. But I realized, no, I will not do that it, just to hit my targets. And for some of you who have been here a long time already, you've probably heard my wife already share a little testimony about her work. We were not married yet, but she was being told by the company, by her boss, to lie just so that they can get a good contract with their supplier. And if that was her main project, and if she doesn't get the project, then she could lose her job. But when she was sharing this to me, I told her, okay, we we're not married yet, but she was already practicing submission. Okay. Okay. Not that it's biblical, okay, at that time, but she still practiced that. She said, uh, she said, if this happens, you know, I can receive the consequences. I can lose my job if I don't hit the targets, if I don't get this contract. Then I told her, then so be it. But Lord, please don't. Okay, I prayed. Okay, she prayed. And God spoke to her. God, God woke her up in the, uh, the middle of the night, around 3 a.m., right? And God spoke to her when she read the Bible. God was confirming in her heart to be truthful. Okay? When she told this to her boss, her boss could not believe that Lay would not lie. But later on, you know what? After a couple of weeks of negotiation with the supplier, in the end, Lay got the contract. And she did not compromise. And her boss saw Lay's convictions and her trust in the Lord. So in the same way, how about you? Do you also lack a trust in God? Do you have low self-esteem? And for the desire of power, possible root cause of this is pride. Eh? You, don't want, you don't want it to happen. So you do something to cover your pride. Eh? Now, going back in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, it says, right, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? You lie to the Spirit, you lie to God. And it says here, how is it, Ananias, that Satan has so filled your heart? What does this mean? When we lie, Satan is involved. Satan is involved in lies. And I will give you a verse later on. Remember, he is the father of of lies. Okay? So we need to expose the truth about lies if we want to fight this. Okay? Are you ready? Let's expose the truth about lies. First, let's read Psalm 15 verse 1 to 6 or 1 to 5. And you can look at this. 
Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? Okay, so who can be in God's presence? Look, verse, look at verse 2 to 5. The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, casts no slur on others, despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent, and whoever does these things will never be shaken. If you will look at those verses, a lot of those verses talk about truth versus deception, about lying versus honesty. God is saying, you want to be in my presence? Then you have to tell the truth. You have to be honest because God is the God of truth and He can never commend lying. So, what are the truth about lies? Looking at those verses, let me summarize. Number one, it is totally against the will and nature of God. Many times we can list down the character traits that God accepts, right? Many are related here on lying. I'll repeat those verses, right? About, it's about being blameless, speaking the truth, slander, slur, keeping an oath, doesn't change your mind, ac- not accepting bribe. Look at this. All of this is about God hating deceit and lying. Number two, and this is even more practical, it ruins relationships. Do you want to be friends with someone who lies to you constantly? No one wants to be friends with liars because they cannot be trusted and they hurt others. You lose respect. How can there be love in a marriage if there is no truth? if the husband and wife lie to each other, right? So we have to be careful. Another is, I want you to imagine a society. Imagine a society where lying is acceptable. You have money, you go to the bank, and then you give the money to the bank for their deposit, for their safety, right? And then the bank teller has no obligation to tell you the truth. Because lying is acceptable. And they will say, oh, okay, you deposited this amount, but you actually deposited a bigger amount. Okay? Now you go to the office, and the office, the boss tells you, just hit your sales targets, and I will give you a bonus totaling one month of your salary. One month extra salary. Would you like that? And you work hard, and you hit your targets, And then your boss tells you after, I was just lying. Can you imagine how painful that is? Okay? Now, how about in the education sector? If the teachers that we entrust our children with can lie to our children, what's going to happen to the education of this country if that is all right? Okay? Now, how about what if in that society also, doctors don't need to tell the truth. You can, the doctors can lie. Okay? What's going to happen? You're very sick. And the doctor said, Oh no, it's okay. You're not sick. You can go home. Okay? It's alright. But the truth is, you're very sick. What's going to happen? So we have to be careful. Now children, sometimes, the young ones, sometimes you complain that your parents don't trust you enough. But maybe, just maybe, it's because you lied to them in the past. And therefore, trust is broken. So you have to rebuild that trust. And the amount of time required to rebuild that trust is beyond your control. But you start it by saying one truth at a time. Next is, well, it says here, it steals personal peace. Okay, why? Because you're thinking, oh, what's going to happen if they find out I'm lying? Or sometimes also you lose your peace by thinking, what if I just told the truth? Can you, do you remember about Jacob and Esau? Who was the deceiver? Jacob, right? So what was the benefit of the lie? What was the benefit of Jacob when he lied? 
he received the the blessing, the birthright, right? So, lying has its benefits. Just like any other sin, lying can have its benefits. But, on a temporary basis. Right? For example, what happened? Because Jacob lied, what did he have to do? He had to leave his family. So, it ruined his relationships. Right? Because, he had to run away because he might be killed by Esau. It ruined the relationship within the family. Not only that, remember when Esau and Jacob were about to cross paths? Jacob was so scared. What if Esau was still angry with me? So what did he do? He would send gifts ahead of him so that, uh, to soften the heart of Esau. Right? So it stole his personal peace for all those years because of his one lie. Yes, lying can have its benefits, but it is not permanent. It is only temporal. Number four is it will eventually catch up on you. Right? Eventually, you will get caught and there will be consequences from God and from others. Look at this quote. Look at this quote. A liar should have a good memory. Right? Because if you told a lie, you have to remember what lie you said so that when you talk to others, you have to be able to remember that lie. And because you lied, you have to cover up that lie. And now you have to remember that other lie. Alright? And then you keep on remembering all those lies and then later on you will slip up. Okay? So because you started lying. But you know what? If you tell the truth, you don't need a good memory. Okay? That's why I'm so forgetful. <laughs> no. But you know what? If you, you don't need to try remembering all the lies you said because you have to remember, you, you just remember the truth. That's why for me and my wife, everywhere we go, we share our testimonies, how God transformed us. Because, and we don't have to memorize. We don't have to talk, well, what, you're, what are you going to say? Yeah, okay. If you're going to say that, I'm going to say this. We don't talk about that. Because we know our testimony is true. Wherever we go, we don't have to remember what to say in a sense because we are all telling the truth anyway. So be careful because it will eventually catch up on you. And then another is, it connects to other sins. You might need to lie to cover up more lies. For example, what other sins? If there's adultery in a marriage, is there also lying? Of course! So lying can lead to adultery and adultery can also add to lies. When it comes to stealing, there is also lying there. When there is cheating, okay, now if I ask you, who among you here, you cheated at least once in school, you cheated. Raise your hand. Okay? Wow! Welcome to the club. Okay. You know what Chichi F stands for? <laughs> you know what? All of us have sinned. How about bribing? Okay. Is bribing lying also? Yes. So a lot of things. Now when I think when I think about this, there are a lot of things happening. Bribery when it comes to, you know, businesses, etc. So we have to be careful. And here's another. It can become an addiction. Really? I've seen people like this. To the point that you no longer know the difference between what you're saying is true or false. And sometimes you will lie already even if nothing much is at stake. Okay? So I've worked with someone early years in my career, I've worked with someone who lied a lot just to please people. And anything he says, I start questioning because of the many past lying that he said. You still remember the fable, Aesop's fable, the boy who cried wolf? Do you still remember? What was the story about? Right? The boy will shout, wolf, wolf, wolf. And then what happened? So the, villager, the villagers will get scared and prepare, go inside their homes, be, you know, have all these things happening because there's a wolf. And then they'll find out it's just a trick. And the boy will keep on repeating that, repeating that, wolf, wolf, wolf. And then later on what happened? There was a real wolf, and when the boy cried, wolf, 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 
no one believed and tragedy struck the villagers. There will be times if there is a habitual lying, people will no longer believe even when you're already telling the truth. And that is the truth about lies. Okay? Now, when you look at this, can you imagine why lie? It is better to tell the truth. Imagine instead if we tell the truth. Imagine, if you tell the truth, then you will be aligned to the will of God. And we know this, obedience brings blessings. If you tell the truth all the time, you will rebuild your broken relationships. There will be stronger relationships between husband and wife. There will be stronger relationships between parents and children. There will be stronger relationships between our church if we are all telling the truth. And imagine, if we are all telling the truth, we will have personal peace. We will have less worries. We will avoid many other sins. And you will, it will hinder yourself from being addicted to it. Okay? So this is a very interesting testimony about someone who for a time became addicted to lying. And I want to share to you this testimony. It's a bit of an extreme, but I realized we will be in the same pathway if we are not careful. So let's watch this video. Growing up, I constantly compared myself to my siblings and friends, which led to me believing that I was less of a person than they were. This led to a never-ending cycle of craving the affection and approval of others. These feelings intensified when a series of events led my mom to leaving our family in my early teen years. In my desperation to gain the approval and affection of others, I began making things up about myself. In grade school, I told people that I was from Hawaii and that I grew up as a beach baby. I even used photos from a summer camp I attended to back up my lies. I dramatized my mom's absence even further to gain sympathy from others, and I faked being a smoker to seem cool to my peers, which eventually led to my two-pack-a-day habit. In my jealousy of the friendships and relationships of others, my lies continued to evolve. And to protect these lies, I would have to tell even more lies and do more drastic things to support them. When a good friend of mine started dating the guy that I liked, to take his attention from me, I lied about having an ex-boyfriend who was stalking and hurting me. One night, when I wasn't the, getting the attention that I wanted from him at a party, I went outside, found the biggest rock that I could find, and started hitting myself repeatedly on the forehead until an angry red lump had formed. As I watched him run out to chase down my would-be assailant, I remember feeling regretful not because I lied to him, but because I didn't hit myself hard enough to cause my forehead to split and bleed. Another instance is when I became friends with a girl named Ambreen. We were inseparable, but I wasn't happy when two other girls got close to her. To manipulate her emotions, I created a fictional guy who had all the qualities that Ambreen found attractive in men. I fabricated a fake online profile of him with dozens of photos and a chat account so both of them could talk. She lowered her guards and developed feelings for this fictional person. For months, this continued, and I was overjoyed when she would run to me with problems and, um, that only I could advise her on and help her fix. I still remember the look of betrayal and hatred on her face when a slip on my end led to her finding out that the guy she was falling in love with didn't exist at all. When I was caught and left with no friends again, I was almost relieved when our family moved back to the Philippines in 2006. No more lies, I told myself, but eventually I went back to my old ways. My compromises only worsened after my father's sudden death in the same year. I started smoking, drinking heavily, and smoking marijuana. I had premarital sex and even got involved with another girl just to impress a guy I was interested in. I filled my days with vices and promiscuity. In 2014, I entered into my first serious relationship. I thought I was finally getting the love, attention, and acceptance that I was craving for. I was so intoxicated with him that I didn't care about the immorality and sinful lifestyle that we were living. 
Later in the same year, I was invited by a friend to attend Sunday service here at CCF. I enjoyed the service and found myself coming back week after week. At the end of each service, Pastor Peter would invite people to stand and receive Jesus into their lives. I would always feel a desire to stand up, but quickly rationalize that I wasn't as bad as the other people in the world, and so I didn't need to stand up. Then, on one Sunday morning, I heard the verse that shook me to my very core. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Revelation 21, verse 8. Stunned, I felt the weight of every lie come crashing down on me. I was a liar and sexually immoral. I was a coward, and indeed, I was faithless. On that day, with tears on my face, I repented and asked Jesus to take hold of my life as my Lord and Savior. Slowly but surely, the Lord began to work mightily in my life. I joined a discipleship group where I began to grow deeper in my knowledge of God and His grace. I was doubly blessed when I learned that my younger sister had also come to Christ through the CCF live stream. I was thirsty and regularly spent time with the Lord, attended GLC classes, services, and met regularly with my D group. Then, on September 12, 2015, I publicly declared Jesus as my Lord and Savior. As I grew in my knowledge of Him, the Holy Spirit convicted me to end my relationship with my boyfriend. Furthermore, I found it harder and more painful to lie. Old habits that were so easy and natural in the past brought pain and conviction from the Holy Spirit. Today, the Lord is still at work and continues to be faithful in my life. I am blessed to be serving in full-time ministry as the social media manager of CCF, and I currently lead my own group through the big singles ministry. I no longer feel the need to lie about who I am and find my acceptance and love in Jesus Christ. I am Megan, a former imperfect and depraved sinner, now a new creation who has been bought, redeemed by the precious blood and love of Jesus Christ. To him alone be all the glory and praise. You know, sometimes when we think lying is a small sin and we start compromising, it just gets worse and worse. So how can we become truthful? How do we start becoming truthful? Well, first is we have to remember that lying is a sin, not a lesser sin. All right? Um, so she quoted the verse in Revelation 21.8. Okay, sorry, I made a mistake. It's not Revelation 3.20. Revelation 21.8. It says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. This is what she quoted, right? So, based on this verse, lying is in the same verse as murderers, sexually immoral, practicing magic arts, witchcraft, idolaters. So it's in the same boat. It is not a lesser sin. And the consequences is second death. Have you heard of the statement, liars go to hell? Well, you know what? I don't know where they got that, but we know, biblically, it is, this is the verse, liars go to hell. Secondly, remind yourself of the truth about lies. That's the thing what we talked about, right? It's totally against the will of God. In John ch chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus was describing Satan. What did he say? You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is going to lie to you. He will tell you you have to lie in order to gain something better. Remember, Satan lied to Adam and Eve. And he will continue to do that today. And one of the greatest lies of Satan today is to tell you that God is not trustworthy 
and God's word is not trustworthy. And therefore, you need to find your own way and your own solution in this world. Another is, you want to start being truthful, is you renew any commitment you made to God and others which you haven't been following through. You tell that to God. You say, Lord, I'm sorry. I repent. I renew my commitment which I have not been doing to you. Whether it's a commitment for quiet time, a commitment that you will read His Word every day, or, or something that you're going to do for Him, any spiritual habit, and you haven't been doing it regularly as much as you vowed, you repent and you renew that commitment to God. If you have broken promises to your children, to your wife, to your spouse, then this is your day to renew your commitment to them. Next is, you refrain from making rash commitments. Okay? Think about it first. If you say, for example, okay, someone asks you, can you go to D group? And then what's your answer? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go, I'll try, I'll go, I'll try. Then what happens? You don't attend. Is that lying? Perhaps, right? Because sometimes, even if you say, yeah, I'll try, but the truth is, you already made some other commitment and you had no plans of meeting that commitment. That is already lying. Okay? And then, number five is resort to truth in all areas and at all costs. So we go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill the Lord to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. What's verse 37? All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Basically, it's saying here, yeah, you make vows to the Lord. But you know what? It's because during that time, when you make vows, you really mean what you say. But because of what the Pharisees have done, it got so confusing. Bottom line, just go back to what it should be. Say what you mean and mean what you say. That's how to go about it. So, what areas in your life? First, in your personal life. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9, it says, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. So, you be honest to yourself. What do I mean? For example, there are actions that you do. Or you serve, for example, in the church. So it's great. Externally, you're serving. But your heart is not in it. You are, your motives are impure. You're fooling yourself. You're not being truthful to yourself. You're acting out externally, but internally, you are not. That is why we have to be very careful. Another is, you be truthful in your family. Eh? When you... Do you, do, you, do you see this? When you promise something to your children, they remember. They remember. Okay? So, this is just what I did just so that we can build, they, they can trust my word. I've taught Zoe, I told Zoe, Zoe, I will not promise to you. But whatever I say, I will do everything I can to make it happen. So, I will not promise. Whatever I say, I will do it. Okay? So if you ask Zoe, does your dad make promises? He, she will actually say no. And I will ask her why. why? You can ask her why. Why doesn't your dad make promises? And Zoe will answer, because whatever he says, he's going to do it anyway. Do you understand? Okay? This is just, an, just a thought of just mean what you say and say what you mean. Another is in your workplace, be truthful. Or in your school, Eh? Make sure that you're truthful. You do everything you can. Build trust through your integrity. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. So, it's saying here, do not lie to each other. Enough is enough. 
You're a new creation. You're a Christ follower. So you start being truthful because God is truthful. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 22, it, first verse 20, it says, look at this, very interesting verse. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or, and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they, cannot, they have not seen. Wow! God is saying, you are a liar if you say you love God, but you don't love the people around you. You don't love your churchmates. Okay? Or maybe you say, yeah, yeah, I don't love my churchmates. I just tolerate them. That's still justifying, right? So we have to be careful. Okay, letter D is in your church family. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, it says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of His body and the church. What is this verse saying? We are to speak the truth in love. Okay? We don't speak lies in love. Oh, we love each other, so we won't speak truth. That's one side. Okay? We have to speak truth. But when we speak the truth, it's we speak the truth in love. What does that mean? You speak the truth in love. You show it with gentleness, the right timing, the right words, the right tone of voice. You speak the truth in love. Can you tell your seatmate, speak the truth in love? Okay. So, let's practice truthfulness. Because sometimes we compromise. Right? For example, you, you arrive in Sunday service late. And then you say, oh, why are you late? You say, oh, traffic, traffic. Okay? What's the truth? Is it really traffic or is it because you left late? Right? Now, just imagine this. What if every week you had a meeting with your boss? Every week, you had a meeting with your boss. Monday, 9 a.m. What if every week you're late? What's going to be the consequence? Right? So how about us? Are we taking God for granted? So be truthful as well. And lastly, be truthful in your relationship with God. You admit your sin. You acknowledge, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm not covering up my sin anymore. I'm admitting it. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Who is the liar? Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist. Denying the Father and the Son. Okay? That is a strong statement. Do you believe in the Son of God? So, as a summary, start being truthful. Can you tell your seatmate? Start being truthful. Remember that lying is a sin, not a lesser sin. What else? Okay? Remind yourself that of the truth about lies. And then, renew any commitment you made to God and others which you haven't been following through. Fourth, refrain from making rash commitments. And lastly, resort to truth in all areas and at all costs. If you've been lying or you're stuck in one lie or in a lie, lying situation right now, or perhaps you are in bondage for some sort of lying, let me encourage you. Then perhaps today, God allowed you to be here to break that cycle of lying or that habit of lying. In John chapter 8, verse 32, it says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Rather than being in the bondage of lies, let Jesus set you free. If you have lied to the Lord or lied to anyone, today is the date of repentance. You repent to God. And if you've lied and it has hurt someone, Perhaps today is the day you reconcile with that someone with whom you did not keep your word. In John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus saying, I am the truth, and what I am telling you is the truth. You cannot reach heaven. You cannot be in the presence of God forever in heaven. If it is not true, Jesus Christ. And mind you, there will be people who will not see the presence of God in heaven. 
there will be people. In Psalm chapter 101, verse 7, related to our message today, yes, there will be some people who will not enter the presence of God. Believe me. It says, No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. There will be some people who will never be in the presence of God. That is why there is John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2, it talks about God, who is also truthful. Paul said, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to, the, to further the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. God does not lie. God has so many precious promises in God's word and He promises to keep it. When God says He will provide for all your needs, does He mean what He say? Then why are you worrying? Right? If God promises that He has a wonderful plan for your life, do you believe it? Then why are you not trusting Him enough? You trust the Lord with all the promises that He has in His word because He is a great promise maker and He's a great promise keeper. And one of His greatest promises, as I close, is in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 12. It says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the greatest promise of God. You, all of us, in spite of our sin, we can still be in the presence of a perfect holy God because of Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life. And if you have Jesus in your heart, if you have the truth in your heart, then you also have eternal life. If you can promise God with His provision here while here on earth, you can, you can believe the promises of God to go to heaven. You can trust God. And I encourage you, trust God. Trust in the Lord. Okay? Can you tell your seatmate, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your old understanding. You trust in the Lord. And as I close, I encourage you, for some of you, you have not been trusting the Lord. Really, you are worrying. You are not trusting the Lord. And God is saying, it's time to put your trust in me because I am reliable and I am credible and God cannot lie. For some of you, today is the day that you believe that you can trust God for your eternity. And it says in this verse, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So if you have the Son of God, you've surrendered your life to Him, then you also have eternal life. You don't need to guess whether you're going to heaven or not. You can be sure today. Today, I encourage you, it's time to repent of your sin and lying. It's time to reconcile to people that you've hurt because of your lying. And it's time to recommit your life to Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, O Lord. And Lord, yes, Lord, we repent, Lord, for the times that we did not keep our promises, that we have broken our promise to you and to others. Forgive us for the times that perhaps we've been lying constantly. We've justified lying. We think lying is harmless. But now we realize that it can lead to other sins and it will soften our consciences when it comes to sin. And Lord, if there's anyone, Lord, that we need to reconcile with because we were not truthful enough, can you please give us the strength and the wisdom and the opportunity to reconcile with that person?
And Lord Father God, I pray for the people here, Lord Jesus, who want to believe your promise, your truth, that whoever has the Son has life, whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. If anyone here wants to be sure that they will go to heaven, that they will be in the presence of God, and you want to claim this promise, then pray this prayer with me. Mean it from your heart. Dear God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I acknowledge that I have sinned against you. I acknowledge that I have lied once in my life. I acknowledge that I need a Savior. Today, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all my sins. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that there's no way to reach heaven unless it is through Jesus Christ. I believe that promise. And now I commit my life to you. Jesus, I surrender my life. Lead my life beginning today. I want to follow you. I want to follow your word. Be on the throne of my life and I will follow. And start making me into the kind of person you want me to be. Lord, I pray for everyone, Lord, in this room. That we will be truthful. That we will keep our word. That we will be a church that has strong relationships that follow your will because we are living truthfully. And we pray, Lord, that relationships will be strengthened because we can trust one another to speak the truth because we keep our word. Lord, Father God, as we leave this place, we will speak the truth, O God, with your grace, with our, in our relationship with you, with our children, with our parents, with our communities, in our workplaces, in our school, and wherever we are, we will be truthful. We need your grace and your help, O God. And we thank you that this is the message that you want us to hear today. Thank you, Father God, for we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.